Good morning. That's a good morning. Um, it is the week of Thanksgiving. You all know that. Um, many of you, um, I'm, the ones that I'm speaking to now are not here. Many of you are traveling. So those who are listening to this on Monday, I guess, you're traveling. Um, and Thanksgiving is a great holiday, one of my favorites. But here's the reality of the culture that we live in. Many of you live in this culture, too. So we like to skip Thanksgiving, right? Like some of you have been decorated since October for Christmas, right? Like, like November doesn't exist. Well, it does. It's just decorating time for the big crescendo in December where Christmas time comes. And listen to me. I love Christmas, but I love Thanksgiving too. You know, you just get to sit around the table with family and eat good food. For me, I live two hours away from my family, so I get to go and see them, and it's a really, really special time. And so I look forward to Thanksgiving every year. But some of us in here don't look forward to Thanksgiving at all, and we just leapfrog it into Christmas, mainly the staff here at New City Church, (laughs) besides myself. I'm the only one, I think, that hasn't played Christmas music yet. So I'm just throwing that out there that I look forward to that. But, But to be honest with you, I did look forward to Christmas a lot more as a kid. Like, I look forward to Christmas now, but obviously as a kid, it's like, man, presents, right? I mean, now I I enjoy seeing family. It's fun seeing all the nieces and nephews that I have open presents. But when I was a kid, it was my turn to open presents. And I used to look forward to it so much. And there's this one year in particular where I just knew, okay, I, I, I just knew that I was going to get something called the PSP. Mm, see, we didn't have any college students first service. So everybody over 30 is like, What's a PSP? You know, they're, they're playing Game Boys. So, you know, thank you. PSP, guys, PSP. And what that stands for is PlayStation Portable. Yes. Wow. First Corinthians 15, y'all want it? No, okay. Good. PlayStation, I knew I was getting one. I just knew it. I had asked, and then one day I saw the box under the tree. I was looking to see how many I had, you know, versus my sister, and I saw the rectangle box that it came in. And I just knew that it was a PSP. So what I did was I carefully shook it to make sure. Then I carefully unwrapped it to really make sure. And then I carefully unboxed it and played it for two weeks until Christmas happened. (laughs) I was so excited about the PSP and I looked forward to it so much that I just couldn't help myself. I had to play it. And so Christmas morning came and I opened it and I was really surprised. And, you know, it was like a game had already been saved to it. And so it was just like, my dad's like, you want me to help you set it up? I'm like, oh, I got it. I got it. So it was great. Okay. So that was the BSP. That was, I think my fifth grade year. And I looked forward to it so much. So why do I share that story? Besides illustrating that, like, you know, I open presents if they're under the tree for me. So there's no surprises here. Okay. I ask that, or I I tell that question because we're going to ask this question, and in light of this question, read 1 Corinthians 15, and the question is this. As believers, what do we have to look forward to? I mean, we have Jesus inside of us as believers, right? And like, we can think about heaven, but maybe our morning devotions or what we study in our free time is not this whole idea of what that day actually looks like when bodies are resurrected and we meet with Jesus and are welcomed into a new heaven and a new earth with him. What do we have to look forward to? Is that one of those things? And so that's what we're going to really be looking at today as we wrap up our series masterclass. We've been in 1 Corinthians for about um, a year now, taking breaks for a few different short series, Um, but we've been in 1 Corinthians for a while now. And so we're going to end today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, looking at the final eight to nine verses in chapter 15. Um, And it's just been a really, really special time. And so I know that on the last day of class, we all hate the teacher that tries to teach us something or give us homework or any of that stuff. I get that. But here's the good news. God still wants to teach us something, even on the last day of class. And so I hope that you're here to learn a lot because I'm telling you, the the scriptures are sweet and this just presents a really, really... um, big picture of the love of Jesus and what he has in store for us. And so 1 Corinthians 15, starting in uh, verse 50, if you do not have a Bible around you, or if you do not bring a Bible with you, there's a black one somewhere around you. And if you do not own a Bible, please take that one home. It's our gift to you. But 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50, here's what it says. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, 
but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and corruptible and we will be changed. So let's just pause there and define a few things. So Paul lays out in verse 50, this saying, and then he says that this is what I'm saying. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. On the surface right there, we have a problem. Because as Paul talks about flesh and blood, what he means is this body that you and I walk in, this body that is decaying, this body that gets sick, this body that will one day die. And then on the other side, the supernatural side, this body that sins, this body that does things that we can't even begin to justify. And Paul is saying, look, the flesh and blood that cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He parallels this with maybe a a, a greater picture for us to understand what he's saying, that incorruption cannot inherit corruption. Corruption cannot inherit incorruption. And so there's a problem. Because if you and I walk in this fleshly body, which we all do, all of us in here are walking in flesh, all of us in here live in bodies that get sick and that are dying and decaying, then what do we do if they cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Paul continues and he says this, listen, this is what I'm saying in verse 51. I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. What he's referencing here is if you remember a little bit uh, earlier in, in, in chapter 15, he used this phrase that some have fallen asleep. And essentially what he means is that some have died. When he says asleep and fall asleep, it's, it's some have died, but some haven't. And what Paul is referencing here is this day where the Lord returns and the bodies are resurrected to him. Those who have gone into the ground are resurrected back to, for him. But some, if if Jesus came right now, our bodies are not in the ground. And so we would be in that category of we will not all fall asleep, but, and here's where we're going to spend a majority of our time on this topic, he says we will all be changed. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. He says this in verse 52, and then we continue it as we read together. But here is just what we want you to know on the surface, and maybe I've said it a hundred times, and you're like, well, duh. But here's what you need to know that you will be changed. You will be changed. You might not fall asleep. You might not die before the Lord returns, but all of us, dead or alive, will be changed on this day. And so this is a future event. Paul makes no mistake about it, and he's referring to something that has not yet quite happened. But just before we go any further, what does this, you know, changed mean? Because honestly, this is a huge topic. This is a huge theological debate for years, for years. Men and women would argue in the first all the way up to the 10th century of what does this mean for Christ to have a body and for him to bodily resurrect and did he actually bodily resurrect and what does that mean for us? It's a huge topic. So I just want to give you the clip notes version, okay, of like what this actually means when Paul says we will be changed and our bodies will be resurrected. So right now we live in a body that is dying. We live in a body that sins more than we would like to admit. And one day, all of us, unless the Lord returns, will die. We will be placed into the ground. We will have, hopefully, a funeral. Hopefully, people are at mine, and it's, you know, celebrating a life. And Paul is saying that one day, that will happen. But then there's another day where those bodies will resurrect. If you think back to, um, once again, in chapter 15, he references a seed going into the ground. He gives this this picture for us of a seed being planted, something dying in the ground, and then whatever you planted, it growing and taking root. And so what he's saying is you will be changed in the fact that your body that was put into the ground will be raised incorruptible, will be raised immortal. And so that's what he's setting up right now. And like I said, there's so much more we could say about that. We could jump into like, you know, quantum physics and what does this change look like and all that stuff, but we won't. Um, so that begs the question, so a change will happen, but how will it happen? How does this happen? Look back at verse 52, and this is what he says about this bodily change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. So not only do we need to know that we will be changed, but we also need to know that our change will be instantaneous. Our change will be instantaneous. These phrases, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, this phrasing occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. 
But we know that the Apostle Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians before he was a Christian, was a good Jew. He was, uh, you know, very zealous for the law. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. And the Old Testament is very clear that when it comes to God's judgment, his salvation, his return, it is a sudden, instantaneous event. And so while these phrases occur nowhere else, Paul, thinking back to what the Old Testament teaches us, that when Jesus returns and a judgment occurs and our bodily resurrection occurs, it will be in the moment or the twinkling of an eye. It will be instantaneous. But not only that, but Paul describes what type of change this is. If you look back at verse 53, he says, For this corruptible body, the body that we live in now, the body that was laid into the ground, must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. So he says corruptible to incorruptible, mortal to immortal. So not only will our change be instantaneous, but our bodily change will be complete. There will be no room for improvement when we are resurrected bodily. I hope, and I don't think this, just reading scripture, if you see me in heaven, I hope I don't get the award, you know, when we're a thousand years in, it's like, Adam, you've done really well. You're most improved. And so here's a little bit more changing for you. Like, that's just not how it works. Our change is complete. And then Paul goes on to say this in verse 54 and 57, or through 57, excuse me. Verse 54, when, that's a key word, when, when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, when this corruptible body is putting on incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed or putting on this immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here Paul kind of walks us through this process, if you will. That when this takes place, when the corruptible puts on incorruptibility, when the mortal puts on immortality, then this will take place, and it's what we call a victory hymn. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your sting, this is the song that we will sing. And there's a process. And it got me thinking, where in my life is a process? And there's many things. But I was reminded just recently of the process of graduation, okay? So I am in my second to last semester of my master's degree, and I will, Lord willing, graduate next May. So I'm at the point where I'm just done with school, okay? Like I am just, oh, I am ready to graduate. I'm ready to walk across that stage. I'm ready to um, quit buying textbooks and quit going to class. I love it, but at the same time, I hate it. Um, so I'm just ready to graduate. But there is a process to graduate, correct? Like I can't just walk up into Southeastern and be like, hey, I'm here for my master's degree. They're like here, we'll just sign here. There's a process. And one of those processes is classes. This past weekend, Emily, my wife, and I were at a wedding yesterday, and we had to leave on Friday for the wedding. And so I had a church history paper due last Friday night, two nights ago. And so I knew that in order to graduate, the process that has to take place is I have to take church history, I have to write a paper so that I can pass church history. And guys, I sat in the library most of the week and just did not care about St. Jerome. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I sat there and I was trying to find all this stuff on him and researching. And it's like, dude, I know you did the Vulgate and thank you for your Bible translation, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's good, but I do not care. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's a process. There's a process that I must write that paper, turn it in on time, hopefully pass. There's still a final exam, so the, the verdict's still out. I, I don't know. Um, hopefully pass and graduate. And what happens when I'm graduated? I'm graduated. I don't get more graduated. And that's what Paul is saying here, that a process is taking place. That when the corruptible puts on incorruptibility, the process is happening. And this is what he comes down to. It's, it boils down to this, the Christ hymn, the victory hymn. That when this happens, this will happen. When the corruptible becomes incorruptible, this saying will take place. 
And so why do we need to know that we will be changed? In light of this um, victory hymn, why do we need to know that? And it's simply this. Remembering that we will be changed allows us to remember Jesus' victory. Now, Paul writes this as a future song that we will sing, right? He says, when this happens, then the saying that is written will take place. But that does not mean that we feel no effects of it right now. Because maybe you're asking, so Jesus has no victory right now? Not at all. But as we look forward to the final victory over death that we will have in a resurrected body, we look back at what Jesus has already done. John 1 says this. It'll be on the screen. This is how John um, introduces Jesus to us, to his readers. He says, the word became flesh, flesh, and dwelt among us. He literally became like us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. We just sang about this. This is what we confess, that we believe in the son. We believe in the son who came and made himself flesh. What Paul was just writing about, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus, the incarnate God eternal, put on our flesh. The immortal put on the mortal so that the mortal could put on the immortal, if you will. Jesus came to this earth so that he could redeem not just our spirit, but our body, our entire being. And so as we look forward to the resurrection that we will have, where death is stamped no more, we also must look back at the victory that Jesus has, that it was in his death and resurrection, the body going into the ground and the body raising back up. That is Christ's victory. And because he resurrected, we have a down payment. And we know that we will get to that day. But here's the reality that we still live in. And this is why I believe that Paul writes that this is a future song that we will sing, even though there's implications for us right now. Because death is still painful. Death is still painful. Death stings. And I can remember relatives, friends from high school dying and feeling the sting of death and wondering, God, why is it like this? Why does death have to happen? And we're tempted to wonder that because we forget. We are not changed yet, but you will be. But right now, death is still painful, and we live in that reality. But Jesus is still victorious. And so while this passage seems to have nothing but future language, and it does, Paul also ends this section with something that we can take today. That's something that we don't just have to wait until this day, sit on our hands, put our head in the sand, and just long for the, the day of the Lord to happen. No. Paul, in his wisdom, writing this letter to these people who were really screwed up, I mean, think about it. We've gone through idol meat and temple meat. We've looked at sexual immorality. This guy was sleeping with his stepmother a few chapters ago. I mean, these people had issues. This church had problems. But nevertheless, Paul gives them instruction on what it looks like for them to live until this day of bodily resurrection. And so here, Paul closes with these words. Let's look at verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Here, Paul moves us from a future language to a present day, here's what you know, brothers and sisters. Here's what you believe. And he gives us three things. He says, be steadfast, be immovable, and excel in the Lord's work. And so what do we do with this passage today? How does this impact us this day? And it's simply this. We work with our future in mind. You work with your future in mind. And what does this work look like? Because you might hear that and think, 
So do I just read my Bible as much as I can and come to church every Sunday so that God will love me and he will approve me on this day? No, that is not what our work looks like. Our work looks like being steadfast and movable because we are so sure of the bodily resurrection that nothing is going to hinder that belief for us. That we love and we serve and we give both our time and our money in all of those things because we are so sure that this day is coming. We don't sit on our hands. Heck no. We give to the give club. We serve at church. We give to the church. Hello? We do these things because we are so sure that Jesus changes everything because he resurrected. That's what we do. And so with the resurrection of mind, we work knowing what? And he says it at the end of verse 48, that your labor is not in what? Vain. You're not wasting your time. I think back to one of the first jobs that I had as me and Emily moved here to Wake Forest in the Raleigh area. Before I was at the church full time, I uh, worked at Dick's Sporting Goods. That was one of my first jobs. Not first jobs in my life, but just here. I did work at Starbucks for a month and it was awful, so I quit. Um, man, it was awful. That drive through was so backed up when I was on. It was awful. Awful. So then I went to Dick's Sporting Goods because I saw the promised land. I was mistaken. I worked there for about 11 months and I was the team sports guy, okay? So if you're looking for a team sport thing, looking for a soccer ball, looking for a baseball, want to be fitted for a bat, want to have a glove beaten in, I'm your guy. We would have a lacrosse section and field hockey that no one in the store knew like anything about it. And people would come in and we would literally turn them away. Like it was crazy. But I covered that. And every day that I worked, oh my gosh, every day. At the end of the day, the doors were closed and locked and we would have to clean up the store. And being the team sports guy, I had the pleasure of going to the soccer section and seeing all these shin guards that were perfectly paired, perfectly packaged, perfectly hanging on a hook, destroyed everywhere. Because you know what you do, okay? You guys are animals when it comes to retail stores. <laughs> these parents bring their kids in there and they rip open the package. There's a zipper, but let's rip it open. They try on the shin guards, they don't work. Throw them down, let's try another pair. So every day, I would walk, and I would clean up shin guards. And I'd put the, I, like, sometimes they didn't even match. You had two right shin guards. Like, it just, get them on a hanger and get home. I worked really hard. That's not what, okay. <laughs> and then I would go to the basketball wall, where the basketballs had to be completely perfect for the next day. That you had your, your women's basketballs and you had your men's basketballs. You had your fake leather. You had your genuine leather. Those were up high. And you'd have these kids that would come in here and take the ball in the package and shoot with a goal that's covered. <laughs> and I would have to put all these things, arrange all these things so they looked perfect for people, you people, for you people to come in and just destroy them. You know what I asked? And so did my coworkers every night that we left. What's the freaking point? Like, what? why am I cleaning up all these shin guards? They're easier to get to if they're out of the package. You're just going to rip them open. What is the point? And I know that's silly, and that's like we can all relate to that, but here's something else that I believe we can all relate to. How many times have you uttered to God, what's the freaking point? In your life, when things are so difficult, what does that look like? When God, you promise that in you is life, but my friend just passed away unexpectedly. Jesus, you promise that you are pure, but this addiction keeps rearing its ugly head. What's the freaking point? Why am I going to clean up the shin guards for them to just get thrown down again? Jesus, why am I going to trust that you are good just to be hurt next week? What's the freaking point? And I think Paul is drawing our attention to the future hope that we have to keep us going today. And that's why we must work with our future in mind. It's simply this, that the promise of our future gives us hope for today. Brothers and sisters, you know that your work is not in vain. You are so assured that the bodily resurrection will happen that you have hope for today. So you have work to do. 
If you believe this, you got work to do. But here's the thing. You do not work for a victory. You work from a victory. You do not work so that God will love you more as if that were possible. We work, we serve, we give, we live. We clean up the shin guards <laughs> because Jesus loves us and have called us his own. And so what is the gospel? That Jesus put on flesh, walked among us, was crucified, was buried, and then resurrected bodily so that one day we will be too. And maybe you're thinking, okay, well, that's great, but Adam, so far you've only spoken to believers. I'm not a believer. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is. I'm not too sure about this. What does this have to do with me? I'm glad you asked. Because the Bible tells us that God desires for none to perish, but for all to come into relationship with him. Because of that, we can conclude that God also desires that on this day, when he returns and bodies are resurrected, that he can welcome you into that. That your body will be resurrected and welcomed into your eternal home. Jesus has come for people like you and me. Not impressive. Get it wrong most of the time. Still wondering why I'm not changed yet. Jesus came for me and you. And you can have a relationship with him today. We say it all the time at New City, but simply put, the gospel is that we have nothing to prove and no one to impress. And I'm not that impressive. The gospel is good news because we have a resurrected Savior. If he's not resurrected, then we don't work knowing that our, our, our work is not in vain. And because of that, we can make it through today. And so our bottom line, honestly, as we wrap up this entire series, okay, as we wrap up 1 Corinthians, specifically wrapping up chapter 15 right here, this isn't really a tweetable bottom line, but if I could just encourage you a little bit, I think this is what Paul would say, even to the people in Corinth that were really screwed up, and it's simply this, hold on, hold on, what's your alternative? Give up? Hold on. But I thought I'd be married by now. Hold on. I thought my marriage would be better than this. Hold on. I got to see those family members in four days sitting around a table with them, and I hate them. Hold on. I thought I'd beat this addiction by now. Hold on. I don't even want to live another day. Hold on. The gospel is good news for people like you and me that walk in these scenarios, right? That when we don't like the people we're sitting at, sitting with at Thanksgiving, when our marriage is awful, it's falling apart, we didn't think it'd be like this. When we're still not over things we've been battling for years, what do we do? We hold on to Jesus and know that his down payment in his body, in his resurrection, man, it attributes it to us. So if you're in here today and you're just really struggling, first of all, thanks for being here because this is the place to struggle <laughs> so that we can struggle together. And second of all, Jesus is doing something in your pain. He's doing something in the sexual immorality that was happening in the Corinthian church. He's doing something. And no other God, no other religion can cl claim that. And so hold on today. Because a victory is coming. And one day we will sing, death, where is your sting? Because I don't feel it no more. There is no more death. I don't feel my sin no more. I can sing victoriously. And until then, walk in this process. Just like graduation, right? Maybe your church history paper is what you have to deal with this week. But we do it knowing that Jesus is doing something in our lives. And so the bottom line for today is simply hold on because dawn is coming. Let's pray. Jesus.